All right, well, my, uh, my phone's telling me 12.15. So uh, hopefully everybody's in the right room that they wanna be in. This is Turtles of Wisconsin with Dave Zeig. Uh, my name's Lisa Burns. I'm gonna be the moderator uh, for this room today. And Pat Goggin is gonna be also helping us run the slides. So thanks Dave for uh, being able to help us out today and give your talk on turtles. Uh, just a quick background. Dave Zeig uh, was a Wisconsin conservation warden and retired after a 26 year career as the agency's Northern Regional Enforcement and Science Leader. After retirement, he was elected mayor of the city of Shell Lake and led the city to its status as a sustainable city by, creating, by, by the creation of environmentally friendly ordinances and policies. He's currently a freelance outdoor writer whose work has been published in a variety of outdoor publications. He and his wife also own a short-term rental on the Brewer River, which caters to outdoor enthusiasts. They've also worked with the DNR and Turtles for Tomorrow in establishing a wood turtle nesting sanctuary on the property where they've conducted tours in partnership with the Natural Resource Foundation. So Dave, how would you prefer to take your questions today? Um, so those of you that are in the participant uh, list here, if you could just go to the chat function, if you do have a question, and then we will address that as we go. Um, how does that sound, Dave? Well, that sounds good, Lisa. I, it makes sense to just take them as they come in and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, sounds good. Well, thanks again, Dave, and go ahead. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Pat. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sitting here right now at my computer overlooking beautiful Shell Lake in uh, Northwest Wisconsin, along with a few other of you people, hopefully a few. Uh, as Lisa said, uh, I, uh, I guess if this was a major league baseball team, I would be class A when it comes to turtle presentations. I've been down in, uh, you know, Single A ball. Um, I kind of got involved with turtles uh, primarily through our turtle sanctuary that uh, we established up at our rural river property. But I've kind of been uh, enamored with turtles uh, throughout my working career and uh, and after I uh, after I retired also. They kind of reminded me of the Rodney Dangerfields of the <laughs> of the animal world. They just don't get the respect that they really deserve. But at any rate, uh, Bob Hay, who should be giving this presentation, he uh, was a ret retired DNR herpetologist and also the president of uh, Turtles for Tomorrow. Uh, he was unable to do it. And uh, they were asked whether or not I could uh, uh, try to do my best on it, which I guaranteed I would. Uh, we'll try to do my best. Uh, so we'll start rolling here a little bit. Uh, for what, uh, for uh, general background on turtles, there's 11 different species of turtles in Wisconsin. Um, there is only four that you see relatively often or have varying levels of uh, classifications in Northwest Wisconsin. And we're just gonna run through those uh, kind of quick here. I think on the, the picture you have on your screen right now should show the four. So uh, Pat, can you move the next slide up please? And right here, it's kind of an interesting picture. You see the two painted turtles. And if you look close, Right between the two turtles, you see two eyeballs and a nostril and a looks like a mossy rock. There it is right there. That's the snapping turtle, obviously, uh, quite common. These two are probably the most common turtles you're going to find in northwest Wisconsin. And they're actively uh, laying their nests now, laying their eggs now in their nests. Uh, they're pretty, pretty, pretty neat animals here. The uh, painted turtles are probably the most common. You see those quite often when you're uh, on the roadsides, on ponds, around various lakes and rivers. Uh, both, uh, as it says, both species are habitat generalists. They use lakes, marshes, rivers, and other open waters, um, other wetlands. Uh, next, please. Painted turtle. Pretty clear to see why. Uh, you look, uh, you can see the plasteron. Plasteron is the bottom of the shell the uh, that's what they uh, that's what they're referred to and you can see the the uh, very distinguished looking markings on the bottom of their shells 
And uh, some people will wonder if those, if this is actually designed for any specific purpose or whether they're all the same. And the answer to the question is no, they are not all the same. They're actually, they're very individualistic. And, um, and the reason uh, that's been documented that why the shells are, are different, the plasteron is different, is so other turtles can identify them when they're up on top of the water and the other turtle is below. They've demonstrated that they've been able to actually document uh, individual turtles by the designs on the shell. And as uh, again, as it says here, females mature five to seven years, which is actually quite uh, pretty fast compared to the rest of the turtles that we, uh, that we run into that have much longer maturation uh, span. Uh, at any rate, uh, next slide, please. This is, uh, I took this picture on the Togatek River, the Togatek River here a few years ago. I just, I got a kick out of him. He was sitting there just, uh, it was spring, I was floating the Togatek and uh, having just a heck of a nice float down the river. It was spring, I felt good in the sun and uh, obviously this turtle did too. He just kind of got himself high centered and sat there and soaked up the rays. For those that have not uh, experienced the Totoga Tech, uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's worth a float. Um, one of the wild rivers of Wisconsin, it's uh, designated as such, so the shorelines are protected. And it's, uh, it's really something. It's uh, just like going back what the Wisconsin looked like well, hundreds of years ago. It's, uh, it's a great float. And it's not unu all unusual to see these, uh, these turtles. Uh, background here again to uh, some people there, there's a question whether turtles are uh, amphibians or reptiles this question gets posed periodically and they are clearly uh, they're, they're reptiles they have all reptiles have your dry skin the snakes for example um, scales which actually the turtles do the scutes they call them are the individual uh, portions of the shells that you can see in the painted turtle here now amphibians are uh, your frogs, your toads, your salamanders, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of, of critters. But you're looking at reptiles here. Okay, uh, next one, please. And here is, some call them the bad boy of the turtle world. This is your snapping turtle. Again, the females immature seven to nine years and they lay a single clutch, 30 to 50 eggs. Now these are, uh, you gotta be a little bit uh, careful around, around these things here. Um, you see them all over the state, and there's there's probably as many up in this neck of the woods as anywhere. They're um, found in basically backwaters. They can be in rivers. They can be anywhere. Uh, they're they're pretty good sized critters. They're also along with the painted turtle. They're classified as common in Wisconsin, as opposed to a couple others that are aren't doing as well that we'll get to here momentarily. Uh, they're relatively common. There's a season for them, people that, uh, that harvest them for, uh, for food value. It goes on, not a lot, but it does go on. Uh, some people want them as pets. So there is actually a season on that. I, when my uh, uh, game warning days were going on, I could have told you exactly what it is, but I have not kept up to date on that now. Basically, I, I'm confident that it's, uh, they're protected during this, basically this time of the year, probably until it used to be, I believe, until like the end of July they were um, protected because they're nesting. And the rest of the time of the year, they catch them in, the, in a variety of uh, traps. A lot of them are set with uh, carry-on type bait and they're, uh, they have a lid on the turtle crawls on top and, and is dropped. And they also can be taken by hand. Some people will do that. Some do it in the winter. They actually have a metal rod where they'll poke carefully down until they hear the hollow thumping of in the winter on the marsh edges where there's some open water and then they'll reach down and bring the turtle up. Uh, I don't know if that goes on anymore back when I uh, worked along the Mississippi River it was it was quite common and they, they people often did it. I don't think much is going on anymore there's probably more of a, a pet market now than a food market but again I'm, uh, I'm out of that business now so I can't really uh, comment on that too much. Uh, the snapping turtle is the largest, the heaviest turtle we have in Wisconsin. Average weight is, oh, 10 to about 35 pounds, although there is one recorded that weighed 75 pounds, which is uh, something you got to be pretty careful around. Uh, the carapace, which is the back, uh, 
plastron is the bottom of the shell, the carapace is the top of the shell. It's, uh, you can see how there's segments on it also, the scutes on it. You will often see them literally covered with moss. I mean, you're just, you run your fingernail on it, you have moss coming off, um, coming off the shell. There, uh, you don't wanna get bit by one, I can tell you that. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know from personal experience, but they are, uh, they're quite aggressive. They're, um, you gotta be kind of careful around them. Was, uh, what was it last, you gotta think last year, it was uh, on the driving back home here to Shell Lake, not far from Shell Lake. And I could see emergency lights up on the road ahead of me and cars were backed up. I thought, oh boy, an accident and sat there a while and nothing was moving. And I tried to figure out what was going on. Finally got out of my truck and walked up there and there were, couple of police officers that uh, were standing around a mammoth snapping turtle in the middle of the county highway. And the cars were, packed, were backed up on both sides and uh, people were taking pictures and the police were trying to figure out how to get it off the trail or off the road, I should say, and onto a trail that was alongside of it. And hey, they're not having, not working very well. So. Anyway, I've handled a lot of snapping turtles and I said, well, do you want me to move it for you? And they said, geez, that'd be great. So I grabbed it. Now, one thing what you wanna do if you are going to try to pick up one of these critters, they got a very long neck, very long neck and they can swing it around and get a hold of you. So if you're gonna grab them, you wanna grab them from the back of the shell um, back to the tail. Uh, low, the, back part of the shell, I guess the best way to describe it. There you go. Yeah, a little bit above that. You can, <laughs> there you go, there you go. Uh, one thing I'd be careful too is claws. They've got, you can see when they lay their eggs, they dig, they dig holes in the gravel and uh, I've been gotten more damage from handling them uh, with their claws than I have having gotten bit by them. They normally lay uh, 30 to 50 eggs and 80 to 90 days after they lay their eggs, they will hatch. So sometime around the end of summer, uh, into the fall, these little uh, half dollar sized turtles start making their trip back to the water body where the, where the mother came from. And speaking of mothers, snapping turtles, in fact, all turtles are not going to get high scores when it comes to motherhood. Once they lay the eggs, they're out of there. The new hatchlings are on their own. There's no nurturing. There's no uh, protecting, nothing like that at all. Uh, one reason that you have uh, all these eggs and all these turtles hatching at the same time is because it's kind of a dangerous trip for them to get back to the water where they're um, back to the water with coming out of the nest after they're hatched. Um, and they get picked up by predators, uh, a variety of different critters can get them, um, mammals and birds and everything else. Actually, when, uh, when they are, when they're egg is being hatched, what they have is they have an eye tooth basically, and they can use that to basically peck open the shell and eventually the turtle comes, uh, the baby turtle comes out and make their way to the surface and hike back to the water. So quite the critters. At any rate, yeah, I got that turtle off the road, um, got an ovation by all the people there. So that, <laughs> it was quite the event. Cops were happy, everybody was happy. Turtle was happy. One thing, if you're ever going to be, so we'll get into this a little bit later, but you're inclined to move a turtle, uh, best thing to any, where you're going to see them the majority of the time is on a road. And the reason is that the best uh, gravel, the best conditions, as you can see in this picture right here, you see the, you see the various, uh, the gravel, roadside gravel is where they like to lay their eggs. Uh, they like the consistency of the gravel on the side of the road. And that's why you often find them nesting on the side of a road or crossing a road to get to one side. Uh, it's 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 kind of a slippery slope to tell people to stop your car, get out, and move the turtles because you're risking your own life on on the highway. Uh, I would not encourage it unless you're very confident that it's a location where you can do it safely and not cause an accident, get hit. Uh, if you elect to do that, you pick the turtle up by the by the shell and you carry it in the direction it's going put it into the vegetation on the other side of the road. If they're uh, pointed east and you stop your car, pick them up and move them east, that's the, that's the avenue to go. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's your snapping turtle. They're, uh, the vast majority of the eggs they lay, uh, 
as a lot of them don't hatch period. A lot of them don't make it to maturity, uh, certainly not to seven to nine years. So uh, there's 30 to 50 eggs. You'd be very lucky if any of these things uh, could, uh, could um, end up being a turtle of that size. Anyway, uh, snapping turtle, looking at a couple notes I have here. They're both a scavenger and a hunter. There's literally nothing they won't eat. Uh, they're a top line predator in the aquatic, uh, in the aquatic world. Uh, ducks, snakes, uh, frogs, uh, carrion, they eat a lot of carrion, dead fish, uh, anything dead. Um, several times I've had them take fish that I had on a stringer on the side of a boat or a canoe. Um, they come up and all of a sudden there's all the struggling going on and you look down and there's a 30 pound turtle hanging on to your freshly caught walleye. And then the fight starts, who's gonna, <laughs> who's gonna take it home for supper? So at any rate, uh, again, you gotta be careful if you're gonna be handling them. Uh, when I worked on the Mississippi River, uh, we, there were a lot of turtle trappers back in those, actually, you know, this would have been what, this would have been uh, late 70s. And I noticed, uh, I got to know them pretty well and they're kind of classical, River rats, if you can imagine a river rat, they kind of made their living off the river one way or the other. They all had a toothpick in their hat band or behind their ear or someplace. And I, hey, you guys all got a toothpick, what's that about? And their theory or what they said it was that if you did get bit by a turtle, snapping turtle, you take your, the toothpick and you insert it into their nostril. You don't have to do it far, they said, just in their nostril and the automatic reaction is they open their jaw. Now, in, uh, in full disclosure, I have absolutely no clue if that's true, nor do I ever wanna find out. But what, I, uh, what I, I do know does work if you happen to get bitten by one is you put it in the water when their mouth is open uh, because they bit your thumb or finger or whatever it is, you put them in the water, they will release the grip. Now, uh, you kinda gotta, <laughs> People ask, a couple times I've been asked when I've been handling these things. I brought a couple to school once that I saw, I thought maybe the teacher who uh, I knew quite well would be interested in uh, seeing them. What happens if, how, how hard do they bite? Are they gonna bite your finger off? Are they gonna bite your thumb off? And the answer to that is no, they're not going to. They've got a painful, powerful bite, but it's, uh, and I forget the exact uh, pounds of pressure, it's less than a human bite. So you think how hard, how hard could you bite somebody? A snapping turtle will be less than that. Not saying you wanna try it out. I know I, know I don't. But at any rate, uh, that's the other uh, quite common turtle in, you're gonna find in Northwest Wisconsin. Uh, we had one, I know uh, Linda Anderson, who I believe is monitoring this right now, uh, has had them in her yard before even. Uh, okay, uh, next, next slide, please. <laughs> this is, uh, if I had to, not handle a turtle, this would be the one on my list. This the spiny soft shell turtle. As you can see, they're not as common. Uh, they're actually classified, um, let's see here, what do they got? They're classified as, they're not threatened, but they're um, special concern. They're a species of special concern, meaning they're one step away from the threatened list. Uh, again, another interest, very interesting turtle. Uh, females mature 12 to 13, lay a clutch 17 to 28 eggs. Uh, and is also as unusual in the turtle world, uh, other than the spiny soft shell turtle, the males are bigger than the females, not so with the spiny soft shell turtles. If you, uh, the reason they're called a spiny soft shell, well, is pretty clear. Uh, there's spines on them and they've got a soft shell. If you look at the turtle on the on the left, uh, the the female, you see the you can see the spines coming on the on the end of the carapace there. There you go. That's the uh, that's why they call them spiny. And whoop, there you go. Yep, there it is right there. And they have a a soft shell. It's not a hard shell, and they're they're, they're very flat turtle. They can uh, they often lay in the mud and um, barely see their nose sticking up. You can see their nose right there. You see that point, it's a fleshy, it's almost like, a, well, I can not call it a human nose, but it's not a hard surface. It's a soft, soft substance. But these are aggressive turtles. Um, I 
don't like messing with them. I don't, you don't see them very often. Again, the species of special concern. The last ones I saw was, uh, again, on the Totoga tick. Um, there's a pretty good number of them on the Totoga tick. Not at all unusual to see. So um, if you ever want a really interesting float, there's several, several sections of, the, uh, many sections of the uh, Totoga tick that can be done in a day, half day trip and boy, I'd highly recommend it. But anyway, that's where you're gonna see, uh, that's where you're gonna see the, uh, the spiny soft shell. Growing up, we called these leatherbacks. And uh, because we call them leatherbacks, because well, they kind of got a leather-like back, uh, but that there is actually a, a, a leatherback turtle. I believe it's a sea turtle that actually has the name. But at any rate, they're found, uh, found kind of all over. But if you go on the DNR's website, you'll see that they have not been documented in the majority of the Northern counties, meaning they haven't seen, people haven't uh, actually seen them and documented where they actually are. Uh, at the end of, the, of this little presentation here, I'm gonna give you a, a source from a, a friend of mine that uh, in, in the department, uh, DNR, that uh, is looking for input and where you may see some turtles. It's a, it's a great program. So we'll move on on that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, here you got the blandings. Uh, I'm gonna, can you back up to the uh, stamping turtle once again, real? There, uh, one more. There you go, a snapping turtle. Uh, again, May through July is when they uh, when they do their uh, their nesting. Um, I guess I covered that, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Sixty four to ninety days. The young turtles are on their own, no parental care. All right, I guess I did cover that earlier. So we'll uh, move on to the blandings. The blandings. Now this is one of the two. Uh, rarest, uh, least commonly seen turtles in uh, Northwest Wisconsin. They're, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're a neat turtle. I've only seen one in my life, to be honest with you. I was driving down a road and I saw one and I, I, yeah, that looks a little bit different. I wonder if that's a Blandings by chance. So I stopped and went back and actually got, got a good picture. Uh, what they have is they got a much higher, uh, Carapace, you can see it, the very domed carapace is what they have. And uh, this is a classic coloration of a Blandings. Um, they're, um, they were threatened in 2014 and now they're, as you can see here, they're classified as special concern. And eventually they could very well end up being back on the threatened list. Um, they're very vulnerable for harvesting from the standpoint of the pet trade. Uh, people will look for them, they'll find them, they will steal them, poach them, like game warden days, that's what they would do. Tremendous black market for the Blandings turtle. You, uh, it's just amazing at how much, uh, how much money that you can, uh, people get on the black market for these. We'll get into that a little bit, uh, in a little while here too. They're not a big turtle, they're only about eight inches long. Um, and they're more nervous than most turtles. Uh, painted turtles, you'll see them there. I'm sure you've seen many of them. They're uh, sitting on logs in the side of the road. They're, uh, they're pretty docile. Blanding turtles are nervous. You, you get close to them and they're gone. Uh, this is a clear, this is a very good picture of one. It's, uh, you can see the, again, the domed shell, the domed uh, carapace with the yellow markings on it. The other real distinguishing, uh, feature on them to identify them is their neck and throat area under their head, the bottom of their head, it's uh, yellow. It's just brilliant yellow. And you can pick that out. And again, the, the, domed, the domed shell, much more so than the other turtles, a uh, characteristic that you can see them uh, quite, quite, uh, quite easily. You can identify them from a distance, which is like the one that I saw here. And a little bit of uh, trivia. If you ever, we ever get out of this coronavirus um, situation we're in, we can go back to have uh, lives and friends and things like that. If you ever have a trivia contest and you want to stump people, ask them how the Blandings turtle got their name. The Blandings turtle, this is again one of those little questionably worthwhile bits of information We're named after William Blandings, an American naturalist who died in 1857. So he was the person that found the first 
documented the first landings turtles and decided to name them after himself. Unique in the turtle world because I don't think there were any uh, naturalists named Spiny Leatherback or Woods or, uh, well, it might have been Woods. Anyway, it, named after a person, quite unusual. Um, these are, uh, they're omnivores too. They'll eat most anything. Um, carrion, they'll also eat carrion. A lot of times the blandings are confused with wood turtles, although the habitat is a bit different and not, not terribly different. They, they like shallow, shallower bodies of water. Uh, where the wood turtle likes moving water, he likes moderately flowing to swift flowing rivers. The Blandings does not, uh, doesn't have that uh, characteristic. He likes the shallower, smaller bodies of water. Um, that's where you're gonna see him. Hey Dave. Well, at any rate, uh, let's see here. Um, they do spend a lot of time on land, although the natural environment is in the water and, and you will see them on logs periodically, but you're more likely to see one of these on a shore, like, like this one, uh, basically um, sunning themselves uh, on land rather than in the, in the water. But again, a, a species that's uh, been upgraded to special concern from threatened. The biggest threat to them is illegal uh, harvesting, uh, poaching, selling on the pet trade. Uh, there also uh, is an interesting study I read. I didn't know about this until yesterday, to be honest. I did a little more research on these things. And there's a longevity research going on in the Blandings turtle because they, they show no sign of aging. Uh, unlike, well, I won't speak for you, but for myself, plenty of signs of it. At any rate, uh, they're capable of reproducing eight or nine decades into their lives. They're a very long-lived lived animal. And again, they don't show... Um, they, they, they don't show signs of aging, so they're being studied for that, uh, for that reason. Breeding takes place anytime they're active, mid-May through early July, nests three to 22 eggs, and the hatching is like the other turtles from August until October. 64 to 90 days is uh, the normal uh, incubation time, and again, no parental care. They're on their own when they uh, break out of the eggshell and dig to the surface and head to the, their new home, wherever it is. Okay, uh, next please. Oh, okay, here's another picture of the, of the blanding. Here you got a good look at the yellow, the yellow under their, under their neck there. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of them, gotta boot up here again. Um, six to 15 eggs, 67 percent of mature females nest each year, which is one of the reasons why they don't reproduce every year. One of the reasons why their population is not doing all that hot. And again, both males, females, as it says, have the bright yellow throats. Okay, next slide, please. Blanding's turtle life history, I guess I went through quite a bit of this already. Uh, one that's kind of interesting, it will travel over a mile and a half from the water to rest which is a little unusual. Uh, most turtles, uh, wood turtles will too. They'll go a long way. They are painted and the snapping turtles don't travel that far, which may be one reason that they're more common. They don't have the risk of moving through um, cover that they can become vulnerable with a variety of predators, including human. Again, blanding turtles, variety of wetland types prefer shallow to deep marshes, uh, emergent vegetation. Uh, have a hinge shell too, which is unique. The other turtles don't have the hinge shell, and you can see the uh, you can see the coloration, a little bit different coloration on the heads of them. But again, the do the, the domed carapace is the biggest uh, biggest telltale marking that, and the yellow the yellow neck on them. All right, next please. Well, here's my favorite. I'll be honest. Uh, it's uh, this is the turtle, actually this is the turtle that got me interested in, uh, in turtles. It's uh, the rarest, it's the most uh, threatened species in the state. It has been, uh, it's doing well. And again, Turtles for Tomorrow and the work that uh, some of us are doing and creating sanctuaries for these wood turtles is, is really helping them a lot. They're, they're, it's working. It's one of those uh, situations that are working and it's, uh, it's going well. They're, they're doing really well. Again, they're named for the annual growth rings. You see the growth rings on them. Now those are not like a tree. It is like a tree, but they're not, um, they're not 
uh, like a tree, it's not each of the whorls is not a year of age. Uh, that's kind of the way they come out. But they're, uh, that's what they are. They're the wood turtles. It's, um, it's legal to possess one of the not protected species. But uh, in wood turtles, unfortunately, they can be uh, privately possessed, uh, privately uh, owned but they have to be reared in captivity. And there's, there's the problem right there. Uh, you can look around and I, I went online uh, oh, a while ago and actually um, checked wood turtle sales. And I found one site that uh, said they averaged $200 each. Another site had four wood turtles for sale. The uh, cost of them, the price was $1,000 each. Well, in uh, Northwest Wisconsin, you can see why that is a uh, motivation for people to take them and sell them. You ever uh, got a little time in your hands, uh, just Google wood turtles for sale and you'll see a whole variety of, uh, of sites. And every one of them have one thing in common. They all say, these are, uh, I have a license for these. These were raised in captivity. These aren't wild turtles. And I don't, believe they all are that way. In fact, uh, the, the comments, the chats that are below these things are for people with similarly cynical as I am, that that's just not, that's not the case. They're, um, a lot of these are taken in the wild. Once they have their private, uh, private uh, license to have captive wild animals, then the, the regulation goes out the window as far as DNR is concerned. So there's a real incentive to take these things and call them, uh, call them captive wild animals, and they're not. Uh, in fact, we uh, we'll get into this a little bit later. We got some pictures of it. We've got. Uh, I found a colony of wood turtles, and now they're a colony animal too. You don't find them evenly distributed across Northwest Wisconsin by any means. Uh, they're a colony animal. You'll have a colony of them in a certain area that's a good habitat for them. And that's how I first, uh, my first experience with them. They're, uh, I, I'd seen these turtles, and to be honest, I wasn't really sure what they, what they actually even were, but kind, I didn't think much about it. And uh, one day I was fishing on the roll, and uh, it was in the fall, and I could hear the brush cracking behind me, and I thought, wow, here's something coming. And of course, in November, when I was in there, you hear brush cracking and a couple of critters chasing each other, you think a deer, there's a buck chasing a doe. And I turned around fully expecting to see a buck chasing a doe. And it was two turtles and they were chasing each other around through the uplands and they've got much longer legs than most turtles. I mean, they go. Uh, I thought, wow, look at that, that's cool. And I had my phone camera and started to try to catch up to them to get a picture and I mean, yeah, I no kid anymore, and I got chest waders out, but you'd think I could keep up with a couple of turtles running through the woods. And I did manage to finally get a couple of pictures of them. But uh, that's their, uh, that's what they do. They, uh, they, they have a very similar time of year mating ritual, and the male chases the female like they do with the deer. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're quite a critter. You get a big kick out of them. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Dave? Yeah. This is Linda. Yep. I am just checking because apparently there, <clears throat> we thought Lisa had a problem with um, relaying some questions. I do, oh. see, um, and, and I just wanted to just chime in. Everything is good. There isn't a problem. I, I apologize, but I just wanted to make sure that things were working. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Bye. Yeah. Uh, no, I, if there are questions, my, uh, I, I'm getting beeps on my phone and my various devices here. Should I be answering those as we go, Lisa? Or, or Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, Lisa. Okay. Uh, just one of the earlier questions. I think it got answered. Um, you're talking about the Blandings turtle um, mm -hmm. being downlisted from threatened to special concern. Did right. that go back to the poaching and that kind of thing? Well, that and habitat, loss of habitat is another big factor. Uh, the Blandings and the wood turtles, there is a black market for them perfectly blunt. There is uh, a lot of demand for them in the, in the captive wildlife industry. But you combine that to the habitat destruction and, uh, and 
road fatalities when they're get up on the road shoulders. I mean, that's what's leading to it. It's not any one thing. We'll get, I got a couple slides coming up on that. Yep. But okay. the, uh, that, yeah, that was the, the only yep. question. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Just uh, jump right in anytime. At any rate, uh, here you can see the, uh, this is again the carapace. You can see the, not the best picture, not totally in focus, but you can see again why they're called wood turtles. They got the rings on them. They're a neat animal. Okay, next slide, please. And the bottom of the wood turtle. This is the uh, plastron. And you can see the, uh, you can see the wood-like, I mean, it really looked like wood, pieces of wood there. And the scutes, you can, again, the scutes are the individual scales, lack of a better word, that make up the plastron. And uh, it actually has a couple of uh, other um, kind of neat purposes. Uh, wood turtles, they just love two things they really like a lot is earthworms and berries. They will literally go, go long distances in order to find berries through the woods. Um, I've seen them way far away from water periodically from the colony around our rural river property. Um, and the other thing is they're earthworms and what they will do, they're interestingly also considered the most intelligent turtle. They've done maze tests with them and they've had, uh, they've got the mental acuity of mammals when it comes to a, a prize oriented uh, um, goal in a maze. They'll figure that thing out in a hurry. You put them back in there and they'll do the same thing. They'll roar right off in there. So at any rate, what they do is what they will imitate the sound of rain by dropping their carapace on the, uh, or a plastron rather, on the ground. So there's vibrations go into the ground and that causes earthworms to literally come up and they eat them. So that's kind of a, something you don't see from the other turtles. I mean, they figured out enough where they could, uh, they could make that, um, make a living by dropping their, their their plastron down on the ground and get the vibrations up. I read another study that was really interesting on them. This is quite a while ago. I think I got the details right. That they tested a variety of turtles for intelligence by um, putting them on, having them on a, a flat surface of some sort, plywood, I don't, it doesn't really matter, but then having a, a glass at the end of it. So when they walk out, they look, I mean, they, they look down and they, there's nothing solid there. All the other turtles march right straight across the, the glass. The wood turtle would not go. You back up, turn around, go the other way. I guess thinking about it, maybe you could argue that <laughs> that's not so smart. The other ones were able to knew it was glass and walked on. But at any rate, the, what they uh, documented, they made the determination that the wood turtle was uh, the most intelligent of all the turtles. Okay, next please. Uh, another shot of the wood turtle. Again, when you roll them over, adult wood, wood turtle as a concave plastron. You can see how it's concave there, caved in a little bit. And again, that helps with the, the sound when they drop it uh, on the ground in order to bring the earthworms up. Uh, again, long claws, all turtles, you can see the long claws on them. I mean, they're, uh, I, I got scratched a few times when I picked them up and tried to give them different positions, but nothing uh, too fatal. I. I just fascinated by them. I kind of slowly beginning to learn to leave the dark things alone. You got enough pictures of them. So that's kind of what I've been trying to do lately. This is not my picture. I didn't turn them upside down. Okay, next please. Here's one. This is uh, again, the shore of the Brule River. This is one I, I took last year. I didn't fool with them, uh, but I found them on a trail. Classic uh, picture of a, of a wood turtle, just uh, kind of a neat shot. He's right on a walking trail, a fisherman's walking path, not really a trail, walking path. And on his way to find some berries or anything else, they'll eat anything. They're omnivores, they'll eat anything, but they do like berries and worms. Okay. Oh, here's another one. These, these are a series of pictures I took over the years. This is another, another uh, wood turtle there. You can see how well they blend in. This is a fall, fall picture. And, uh, blend right into the into the environment very well. Okay. Oh, here's a male and a female. Uh, again, the males are bigger than the female. This is uh, uh, in the fall, and they will. They have an interesting uh, uh, breeding nesting cycle. 
um, normally this time of the year is when they, they lay their eggs, although they will breed throughout the, throughout the year and then nesting takes place uh, usually May to July. And this was a, a breeding pair that were um, on the edge of, uh, edge of the river. In fact, I think if you look in the lower left, you can actually see there's ice on the water right there. Um, there you go. Yeah, that was a, it was a cold day. It was November, but there they were catching a few rays and enjoying life. Okay, next set. Oh, okay, this is pretty obvious what, uh, what's going on here. The reason this is unique is very seldom do they, uh, do they breed above uh, water. Most of their breeding takes place in the water. So this was unique only from the standpoint that they're on land. And uh, again, this is one that I happened to stumble on there and didn't, hope I didn't offend them or anybody else. But uh, at any rate, it's uh, unusual from the standpoint of where the process is taking place. Okay. Uh, again, here's, a, here's another woody. Uh, females mature 13 to 17. You can see that it's, they have a, takes them longer to become mature and they don't have big clutches of eggs, six to 15 as opposed to some of the other uh, turtles that have much longer, uh, much bigger clutches of eggs. The record was 21, but you can see some of the gravel. You see this gravel on the side of the road. I think that's probably a side of a road, but that's the kind of, that's what they like. They don't like pure sand. They like a little bit of resistance when they dig their nests. And that's, uh, that's what they got going right there. Okay. Wood turtles, semi-terrestrial, living in and adjacent to fast-flowing tannin-stained rivers and streams. Prefer lowlands, upland deciduous forests. Very true. Uh, unlike most turtles, the wood turtles, what's unique about them is they do like faster moving water. Rural river, there's a lot of current up there, uh, very little standing water. And that's what they like. They like uh, water that moves fairly, fairly quickly and have a lot of vegetation next to them. They spend as, probably about as much time in the uplands as they do in the, in the water. Um, cover a lot of ground in the course of a day too. Okay. Hey Pat, can I just say one thing? Can you please turn off Michelle Balk's uh, video? It's just a little distracting. Uh, yeah, I can't, but maybe somebody can. I'll try to find it as you keep going. All right, that sounds good. Female uh, wood turtles, we prefer to nest in open sandy gravelly areas. Here's a good example of one right here. Uh, this was one that did become a, a, a sanctuary later on, but this is a good example of, uh, of, how the, of what they look for there. Sandy gravel roads, shoulders of gravel roads, uh, really attractive to them, especially roads that run in east-west direction because then they have, uh, they get a lot of sunlight. They're more apt to see them on an east-west running road than a north-south running road. And the downside of nesting along roads is uh, pretty clear, traffic, traffic and human poaching. We, uh, every year for the last, oh gosh, well this year we didn't due to a uh, uh, postponed wedding from my son and the coronavirus, which directly related to the postponed wedding. We uh, normally, uh, this is the weekend that uh, our family sponsors a wood turtle tour for the Natural Resource Foundation, um, Madison-based foundation. You probably, some of you are aware of the various uh, programs that are available, the tours that volunteers make, uh, make available. We've done one for, oh gosh, I don't know how many years now, Quite a few years up at our rural property. Um, we incorporate a tour of the, of the uh, sea lamprey barrier protecting the Brule River also within the wood turtle tour and uh, try to find, uh, give everybody a chance to get some pictures and see some wood turtles that come into our sanctuary. Um, interestingly, I, uh, some of you are probably aware of Dan Small, uh, Outdoor Wisconsin, a uh, friend of mine also, that he wanted to come up and have a program on it and uh, would have been a great program, but we were talked out of it by various people that were worried about letting the word out on where the, our sanctuary was because of human predation. They were afraid that there would be people coming in behind the presentation and stealing turtles. So we declined. Uh, 
I'm not too worried about the people that come on the Natural Resource Foundation tour. Pretty good, good folks. Okay, next please. Three primary threats to turtle populations, including the wood turtle, a natural succession, the overgrowth of brush and trees, shading out nesting area, uh, resulting in cluster nesting or using of less suitable nesting sites. Again, one reason that the wood turtle sanctuary we have is uh, going as well as it, is, as it is, okay? And sadly, this is probably a huge amount of the mortality, uh, unsustainable road mortality, natural succession, Force many turtles to nest along roads, resulting in increased female mortality. And that's the problem. The females are the ones that are nesting on the side of the road and females get hit. That really makes a dent in the, dent in the population is the threat increases with more roads and increased traffic also. Um, wood turtles are, and landings are, uh, again, the species of most concern. Okay, next slide, please. Oh yeah, another sad, sad picture, side of a road. Okay, enough of that one. And the third is uh, nest predation. Increasing human population resulted in increased number of human tolerant mammals. This resulted in significant increases in turtle nest predation, often 85 to 100% predation by predators. Uh, interestingly, uh, do a lot of reading on the, oh gosh, what would you call it, uh, pre-European settlement of uh, Northwest Wisconsin. You see the raccoon there, and everybody knows what they are and probably seen lots of them. The uh, Native Americans didn't even have a word for raccoons, there weren't any. Uh, this was not considered raccoon country. They, raccoons have become attracted to people, buildings, uh, dens and um, burrows underneath some of the buildings. And of course the food that might be around bird feeders and garbage and I mean, they're getting to be a nuisance. And they are very active predators on turtle, all turtle nests. Uh, fox also uh, do a lot of it. And right now actually at our sanctuary, we're trying to catch a skunk. We got a darn skunk that's been fooling around there. and Got a couple of live traps out. Uh, our property manager there is trying to get the darn thing before he gets into the into the into the nest if you figure out a way into them hopefully again we'll get into what the sanctuary looks like shortly but uh those are the big some of the big predators but yeah between uh, habitat and road kills and human predation and uh, nest predation that's why turtles are having problems next please uh, here is a predated wood turtle nest. Uh, nest predation occurs shortly after the nests are laid. Successful nests usually have no eggshells above ground. Uh, when they come out of, when they, when they use their, their uh, eye tooth to uh, break the shell open and they're able to crawl out, they, the, the shell remains in the ground. When you see a scenario like this with the shells laying up on, on top of the ground, that's a sign that's been predated. Next, please. Yeah, it's not totally in focus video. This is what uh, I found. This is our property up in uh, Brule. And uh, I, <laughs> I happened to be going down the side of the river one day and I looked at what in the world is this all about? Didn't take too long to figure it out. Uh, next please. Oh, uh, this was another sign. This is uh, the turtle sanctuary. Again, I got a better pictures coming up is at the far end of the garden. This is our garden that we have up in Brule. And um, that's where the protected uh, sanctuary actually is for nesting turtles. But the fence you see right in front of you, the smaller fence, the purpose of that is if the turtles come out of the river, they hit the fence, <coughs> excuse me, they move along the fence line until they get to the sanctuary where they're able to go under the wire and, uh, and do their nesting. So I didn't know what had happened, but something had bulldozed right over the top of, uh, of, our, of our fence. Uh, go ahead. Next, please. And here is the culprit right there, badger. Now, uh, badger are actually doing very well in Wisconsin, uh, very well. And uh, starting to see more and more in, in the northwest, northern, the entire northern tier of the, of the state. It didn't, I never saw one. I grew up in Superior and never saw a badger. And uh, 
now they're you don't see them all the time, but they're definitely doing much better than uh, than they were a few years ago. And that's what had uh, made the, the the dens and did all the tearing up that we saw in the in the previous slide. And then also the what he ended up doing that bad he just went right over the top of our fence to get into the garden and uh, run it around trying to find some other turtle eggs there. So anyway, he got into our, uh, I got some better pictures of the, of the actual um, barrier, the, the, the nesting sanctuary. But this is uh, one shot of it here. And what you can see here is, uh, you see the, uh, the wire that goes right around the fence, right behind the loop in there. There you go, yep. And what that is, the, the top wire is electrified. And the bottom wire, there's one below it, there you go, right there. Bottom wire is just to keep, uh, keep uh, raccoons primarily, that's what we thought we were dealing with was raccoons, to keep them from going under the wire. They climb up over the top of the, of the hot wire, it's solar powered and it doesn't, it doesn't kill them, but probably not gonna come back again when they climb over the top of it. They get zapped pretty good. In fact, what we also did there, you can see uh, would be in the center right of the picture, you see a little, uh, platform, a silver platform up on the, on the one stake there. That's, uh, there you go. That's, uh, we put uh, like peanut butter on that. It's on tin foil. Well, raccoon grabs a hold of that and it's electrified, probably not gonna come back and look for turtle eggs at that particular little nesting site. This one, because again, the, because the badgers are so close to the ground, they're able to go under the bottom wire that the raccoon can't go under. So there, uh, he got underneath there and he uh, it was a female, it was a female and two of the, well, they're called cubs and they're called kits. The young of the badger were uh, also figured this thing out. And by the time we realized what was going on, it, it cleaned out, uh, we have two of these sanctuaries, one at, uh, we've got a VRBO rental, uh, short-term rental on the property. That was the picture that showed the, the, the guiding fence that was knocked down. That was uh, completely, that, that sanctuary was completely cleaned out of eggs as was this one in our cabin, which is a few hundred yards away. Wiped out, he got killed every one of them. Got every one of those things before we figured out what was going on. I uh, managed to chase him out of there, but he'd done, done the damage by then. Okay, next please. Hey Dave, I just wanna yeah. give you a heads up. We got about 10 minutes left. Okay, I'll start rolling. So uh, I, I got a permit from the DNR to get rid of these things. So he said, you can do what you want, animals doing damage. So I, uh, I, I could have shot them, but I didn't have the stomach for that. So uh, together with a biologist up there, a friend of mine, we set out cage traps and we baited them, as you can see, with chicken eggs. We thought, well, hey, you know, that's what they're looking for. And the first night we ended up with all three of them. So next slide. There they are. We set the traps next to each other and put an egg in each one and uh, all three of them were caught that first night. We gave them a ride to the Solon Springs area and dropped them off out in the sand flats there and, and they uh, presumably were happy ever after. We were glad to get rid of them. They do like yeah, a lot of clay soil up there. You wouldn't think that would be badger country, but along the river, you have a lot of sand and that's, what, that's the kind of country they like. So anyway, that had a sad story for one year, uh, one year class of wood turtles, but uh, we got them out of there safely. Next. <coughs> kind of interesting, you see how flat they get. We turned them loose and uh, boy, I'll tell you, flatten right out. Just man, like a, like a dollar bill laying on the grass. There he was. Uh, that's why they can get underneath that wire so easily. They just they can flatten themselves out so much. But they're, you hear all these stories, how vicious they are and, and they are. I have had them when I was working, I have uh, my working warden days, uh, I let a couple out of traps for people. And boy, I'll tell you, one of them chased me right back to the truck and I read up in the bed of the truck and started chewing on the tires and, and uh, <laughs> started to walk away. So I climbed out, he came right back again. And uh, anyway, yeah, they're, uh, they get corked off. You gotta be careful. This one was very docile. Okay, next. Okay, here's a beginning of a turtle sanctuary that is being set up. Uh, improves the hatch rate to address different species recovery. Um, 3,500 feet is a kind of a good nesting site. Now you clear off the vegetation where it gets plenty of sunlight and there you go. Uh, next please. 
And here, uh, this is, uh, shows that the uh, improved nesting sites, it didn't really do a lot of good. These are sites that have been uh, predated. You can see where they've been dug up by different critters. Next. This is uh, the biologist uh, for DNR out of rural, Greg Kessler, good, good guy. What we did one year when we found the wood turtles before we had the sanctuary is we marked where they were and Greg came and he harvested the eggs and uh, incubated them and raised them or hatched them and then uh, released them. You can see the little turtles up to the right of the container there. You see them on the garden. There you go. That's baby wood turtles that Greg uh, hatched, take, took them home, took the eggs home, recovered the eggs, took them home and hatched them. Give him credit. Next, please. And there is a little baby wood turtle. That's what we're looking for in this whole program. Okay, next. Ah, another picture of the same little turtle. Cool little animals. Next. Yeah, we got a series of these here. Take a look at which ones we got. Yeah, there's another one. Okay, just keep rolling and I'll interrupt here if we need. And then Greg took them, he, uh, after they were hashed, he took them to the river as to rural and uh, dumped them out, right? Uh, sp kind of spaced them a little bit out. So they're, hopefully they're doing well. You know, that was a time of the year the German Browns were in the river and he was a little worried that <laughs> German Browns might be eating all those wood turtles. I don't know if that happened. Next. Okay, here's our fence. Again, this is a little better shot of it here. You can see the turtle literally going underneath, uh, uh, underneath the fence, underneath uh, the wire there that the other critters can't. They go over the top and they get zapped. The uh, solar power panel, you can see it there in the right center, that uh, gives the electricity that uh, the top strand is, is hot, why it's hot. And uh, you see the little uh, aluminum, aluminum foil there, that gives them a jolt. Okay, and here's a completed solar powered turtle sanctuary. Now that's just like your, uh, a gravel driveway. That's the consistency of it or a road shoulder. It's exactly what it is and boy, it works. It attracts them, really attracts them well. And it gives them a safe place to lay their eggs and safe from predation. Uh, next. Here's one, this is our site again right here. This is our, one of my turtles uh, digging, a, digging a hole, okay. All right, uh, this, is this is something that they're starting to do now too. They're uh, uh, putting some uh, boxes filled with a roll top top that allows for vegetation control without using herbicides. We take care of our own. We just hand pull weeds in the turtle sanctuary. We took a, a chunk of our garden and uh, gave it over to the turtles, sanctioned it off and put the electricity around it and a few less potatoes and squash every year, but well worth it. Next. Here, this is, uh, this, is our, this is one of our uh, two sanctuaries at our rural property. And there's three turtles. They're not at all possessive about the good sites. So three nesting at the same time. And you can see the results from the four nesting sites in Northwest Wisconsin, uh, ha different hatchling produced. And uh, you can see in 2017, it uh, dropped. That was the year of the badger. The year of the badger got into them and did so much damage. Okay. Uh, four sites have been restored, 24 have been created, no, 28 sites, 24 electric, three turtle nest boxes, and one unfenced site. <clears throat> 17 rivers in nine northern Wisconsin counties have these uh, restored and protected areas, and they're working really well. Uh, 25 sites developed before 19, 2019 produced wood turtle hatchlings. So that's one reason that they've been uh, moved from uh, threatened to a series of special concern. Okay. Uh, and here's the turtles for tomorrow. Uh, nest sites, there's six in Douglas County, of course, rural rivers right up there. There's four, Bayfield, one Ashland, Price and Taylor. <coughs> and then over on the east side of the state, there's a few more, you can see where those are, but Northwest Wisconsin, those are the ones you can see on the screen there. Total nest sites through 2019. So they're not a lot. It's quite a bit of a work process to get one established. But one thing, Turtles for Tomorrow and DNR would like to know, if you know of a colony of turtles or a turtle crossing area, they would like to know about it so they can make some, uh, they have plans in order to put turtle crossing signs possibly, or maybe uh, underpass even if there's enough of a concern about the different species of turtles. So um, that would be, uh, if you go to the DNR website, there's a 
wonderful program they got going there that tries to locate sites of uh, turtle crossings and specific turtle nesting areas. Uh, Lisa Gomets, uh, some of you may know Lisa, she works in communications department for the agency, uh, is spearheading this uh, protection of the turtles. And, um, if you go to the DNR website, you will be able to find a great video on the best way to identify these places that uh, might help you out. Okay, next. So, okay, protecting the nested, uh, identify protecting the turtle nest. There's ways of actually doing that. Uh, and you can kind of tell the difference. The snapping turtles, they have a great big mess type thing. Um, all species, but uh, except the, the snapping turtles, you'll see the, the nests uh, flattened out and claw marks around the edges of it. But that's what the depressions they look like. Again, often on the sides of the road, the one on the right there. That's definitely a sign of a road. Yep. Okay. Hey, Dave. I I hate to cut you off, but we are getting down to about a minute here. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Think I'm just about done. Uh, let's okay. See where I'm at. Yeah, I think I'm just about through. You want to run through these slides quick? Uh, I can maybe something I missed here. Oh, this is a way that you can protect. You got a turtle nest. You know where it is. Put that screen over the top of it and. Uh, Mark your calendar and you can uh, pull the wire off uh, 50 to 60 days after it's placed. That protects them from the predation from the raccoons and skunks. Next. Yeah, it is, kind of shows how to make it. It's not rocket science. You can see you just need some type of a screen <coughs> protecting, the, protecting the site. That screen's, leave, an in, that screen's an inch and a half? Is that what those in, little inch and a half wide gaps, yeah, in the screen, yeah. And then there's uh, the corners are open. That's where that's where the I should say that's where the inch and a half gap is. So that's when the turtles hatch. They've got a little bit of space above the screen. And if you're not there to remove it prior to uh, hatching, then they can just slip right out through the corners there. Okay. What do you do if you find a turtle crossing a road? I think I covered that earlier. Uh, don't move it to a different location. Don't take it home as a pet and be careful you don't, uh, you don't get run over. Oh, here, this is kind of interesting. Turtles are getting a lot of respect all over. $350,000 fine for a defendant in, uh, I think it was Oklahoma, yeah, trying to sell these uh, blandings and wood turtles in uh, China. And he was charged federally $350,000 of fines and restitutions. Uh, he was in the market big time, okay? Here, this is, uh, I pulled this off of a uh, uh, website too. 360 bucks, 390 bucks, North American wood turtles for sale. Captive red, you can see in the bottom, baby wood turtles. Yeah, captive red, yeah, maybe, maybe not. If you'd like to learn more about Turtles for Tomorrow, please check out the website, turtlesfortomorrow.org. Good outfit, good agency, kind of protecting the Rodney Dangerfields. They're not, they're not charismatic megafauna like the elk and the wolves are, but they got a place and uh, they need a little protection. Probably wrapping it up, Lisa, if anybody has questions, uh, if you want to give them my contact information, if I don't know the answer, I'll get it for them. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave.